Welcome aboard the Boat Buyers Secret Weapon Podcast, where we're dedicated to helping first-time and experienced boat buyers find the right boat at the best price, so they have years and years of boating fun, because life truly is better on a boat. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Boat Buyers Secret Weapon YouTube channel. Don't pay too much for your next boat. Just visit BoatBuyersSecretWeapon.com slash save to watch a short video. Now, let's hop aboard and have some fun. Well, tell everybody, kind of tell everybody, set the stage for where you're at in life, what your family looks like, and, and where you were when you said, hey, maybe boating is, is something we should look into. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Rod. Uh, I live just outside of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and only recently. Uh, I'm a recent retiree living and working in the metro Atlanta area for um, 40 years and have been um, getting ready to uh, pull the trigger on retirement, and that finally happened at the end of 2018. So I've got one year of retirement under my belt in 2019 other than trying to figure out what day it was and, <laughs> and having my wife uh, tell me, look, I am not your secretary. You take care of your own uh, calendar and stuff. Once I got those two things squared away, I started settling in to retirement better. The draw for the whole retirement thing and the move was uh, my daughter, my son-in-law, and our four small grandchildren. So I tell folks that even when you talk to them on FaceTime when we were living in Atlanta, you were wore out by the end of that call. So I am <laughs> living with them. Uh, they are just always on high energy and just an absolute joy. And um, we wanted to be near them and 400 miles away. We tried to see them as much as we could. But retirement for us meant we wanted to be four minutes away. Yep. So a year ago, we moved uh, just uh, down the road from them and actually went in a way different direction, which uh, I think will help with the whole boat thing for me. And that is all our lives, we were in HOAs and subdivisions, my wife and myself. And we decided to get uh, some land. We're not in an HOA. We're on our own. And uh, that'll come to my boat storage story uh, in a little bit, um, and how I think that you know makes sense if you can uh, if you can make it happen to have it close to you. Yep. Um, but in any case, we had always thought about a boat situation. Um, we also had thought about an RV, um, and we knew there was something that we wanted to do in terms of spending time with, with uh, the kids, you know, in more of a recreational thing. We've gone on cruises; um, those are awesome recommend them highly, you know, with grandkids, you got the money, you know, they're a great uh, yep. experience and they're great with kids. Um, we thought an RV may be similar, you know, to something like that. Um, but probably the whole COVID thing, you know, putting everybody in, you know, at home and not maybe getting out as much, we got to seriously considering. So my purchase date was in the July timeframe and I'll get to more detail of that, but this year, 2020, first time uh, buyer, never owned a boat before, been around them, always knew people who had them. Um, but never had docked a boat before. Never well, what do you had, think, uh, Rod, what do you think kept you from getting a boat, seriously considering buying a boat before now? Was it strictly the retirement and the time or was yeah, there something yeah, else that kept you? Yeah, it was a job thing. I, okay, traveled, okay. I traveled a ton. I just didn't have the time. Okay. Um, and, you know, time at the end of the day, that's really a misnomer. I didn't make the time. Right. Um, you had we other, all other had priorities. control over our time. That just wasn't a priority. You know, career was probably more of a priority and, and things going in different directions. So uh, just – you know, as my kids were growing up, and so I have a son too, he's not married. Um, but in any case, uh, as you know, we were kind of coming up, we, you know, vacationed and did a bunch of different things, but we just never were in that track. And I don't, I can't really put my finger on it other than that just wasn't something, that, you know, that we were going to do. And so the, uh, in the retirement, timing, we were going to do something different. <laughs> yeah, the timing was right with retirement, and you were going back and forth between RV and boats. What, what swayed you to boats? Do you well, think? I, I think, I, I think. When you think about an RV, and, and to me, they are they are very different. So to try to compare them, you know, is like the old peach and a you know pear. Yep. Uh, to use a different metaphor, uh, and so I think they both have their place. Um, but where I was going was, and it's pretty simple. If you want to do something in the RV, you got to go a ways. I mean, you're not going to jump in the RV. And I get that people could go to a campground an hour away from their house. I get that. Um, but you typically are going to be gone for more than a day if it's yep. going to make an RV sense, um, depending upon where you are from a boating point of view, especially if you're not tied to a, you know, a marina or something like that. Um, and I am going to be doing the trailering thing, okay. um, which is a whole different lifestyle. And you've got to <laughs> really be up on your skills for backing up 36 feet of trailer and boat. Yep. Um, but anyway, um, you, it's a bigger commitment. It's great once you're there, but, you know, with a boat, you can be, you know, a, Two-hour trip, four-hour trip, depending upon your proximity to your body of water. Uh, what, but you're not having to commit for more than a day. 
what lakes are you by there that are, you know, uh, spend a couple hours on the water and you're, you're home for dinner if you want to be? Right. So the one for us, and so I live uh, northeast of Raleigh, so the Virginia border is uh, very close to us. Mm. And the lake that we use is a state park, Carr. It's uh, K-E-R-R, but it's pronounced Carr. Okay. Carr Lake. And it is absolutely awesome. I thought um, you were, I know, I know about um, Smith Mountain Lake up there, but I didn't. I well, that's up in Virginia. Okay, that's a little further. And I've actually had somebody, the boathouse person that I'll talk about later, uh, had told me about uh, that particular uh, lake up there and um, how it was really good. We've not visited there, but Car Lake is only 40 minutes from my house. Oh, perfect. So, and it is huge, and it crosses the Virginia state line. Okay. Um, and it's very, very large. It's about 31 miles if you wanted to, you know, cruise it. Um, in one straight line, but it has, like most lakes do, lots of fingers, big fingers. That um, uh, probably shoreline is hundreds of miles, um, maybe thousands. I'm not sure. But in any case, um, the other lake that's close by to us is Jordan Lake, which is east of Raleigh. And um, I had seen some, um, you know, these things pop up and say best lakes of you insert the state name. Mm -hmm. uh, they had named Jordan Lake number two in North Carolina. Okay. And the uh, big lake near you in the Charlotte area. And yeah, lake Norman. This time. That's it, Lake Norman. They had yep. it as number one. Car wasn't even on there, but um, I thought Jordan, that may be the place. So as we, I'm going back to your original question, what made you go toward, you know, the boating? The RV I think was, you know, a maximum amount of time, um, and I could have focused time with my family, but it wouldn't have to be days and days. And I think I could do more of those things, whereas I'd have to plan more, um, you know, with an RV. And again, it's not that they're bad. It's just that I thought that might lend itself. It maybe it was more of an aha moment. So this may be a better better idea for our family. And speaking of family, as I told you, I got four grandkids. So um, my son-in-law is a UPS driver and obviously works during the day um, and weekends. Our strategy was to not be there on the weekends. Our uh, strategy was to be on the lake on the weekdays. I mean, I I'm like off. That. I'm off. You know, my wife, you know, retired. My uh, grandkids are homeschooled. My daughter homeschools all four of them has been way before COVID. It's kind of funny. She's seen everybody has been doing what she's been doing for years. Um, <laughs> Realizing how hard that is. Yeah, and you know she's awesome at it. But anyway, we have a lot of availability, so we take advantage of that. I'll come back. Uh, I'll come back to that with our first uh, release and retrieval uh, story uh, <laughs> on the boating side. Everybody's got to have one of those in our oh, for sure, optimal, for sure. But in any case, um, and so it just seemed like it would be more focused opportunities and probably fit our lifestyle. And because of the size of our family, I mean, if it's just my daughter and the four grandkids, my wife and I. I mean, we're at seven. I throw my son-in-law in there. We're at eight. I throw my son in there, who actually is moving to North Carolina. Um, I'm in Atlanta right now, getting ready to move him. Um, then we're nine. So we cut a wide swath. Um, so that, at, you know, right out of the chute, lent itself, I think, for one of my bigger decisions, which was, you know, simply, I need a lot of space. And yep. so to me, that was a pontoon right out of the chute. So there wasn't so you any knew, other scenario yeah, for me. When you when you said, okay, we're boat RV, and you said boat, you instantly went to pontoon. You just you just knew in your gut that was the right fit for you? I did. And I thought the other thing that I thought was to my son, well, it's a funny story, um, kind of confirmed this, because he grew up with his dad fishing boat, and he always described boating days as long days. They'd be gone early in the morning, late at night. He hated it. He hated going fishing, and the thing he always wanted to do is cruise around or do water sports, and his dad didn't want to do that. <laughs> but pontoon boats in 2020 are very different than they were when my son-in-law you know, was in his teens. He's in his 30s now. And so um, I felt like probably technology had caught up to the pontoon boat, that it wasn't going to be just this five-mile-an-hour putting around you know, a marina somewhere. Um, and obviously, in looking at a lot of your information, um, you know, it, it really kind of set the hook there that, yeah, this was a way we could go. So one thing that I knew was I need a lot of space. So that drew me to the pontoon. You know, the second thing, so anyway, when I get to why the RV versus the boat, those were kind of the big reasons. And obviously a big purchase. Um, I'm familiar with premium kind of purchases. Uh, I'm a Porsche guy. So okay. I know high-end stuff and dealing with it and maintenance of that stuff, and it's not cheap. I also am a big believer in you get what you pay for. Now, that doesn't mean that just because it's more expensive, I want to give you more money because I like it or I want to be taken advantage of. But I also know uh, I'm not necessarily looking for the budget stuff. Right. I, I, I can spy what quality looks like, and uh, but I'm unfamiliar in the boating world. And so I needed a, a few of those nuggets to make sure that I didn't go in a direction that was not going to work you know, for my family. I probably didn't get this, especially during COVID where all boats, it's incredible. Um, most, most boating places have no stock. They've never seen a year like this. They sold everything they had. Yep. And here, here we are coming up, you know, with a similar idea at the time um, and then going out looking for boats. 
and honestly, I went to the very first, um, actually the second shop. First I went to was closed, um, and they had some in shrink wrap. They had some Bennington's. And I actually had a, uh, my previous boss out of Bennington on a lake um, in Georgia uh, that they were very happy with. They told me they had a tri-tune of 250 horsepower, and they were super happy with it. Um, I don't know what model they had, but I know they were probably somewhere in the $100,000 range. And so I knew kind of where top-end stuff was. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started looking at Bennington's and Paris's. I started looking at, you know, I went on YouTube, discovered your videos. And the real story here is I did a binge um, – uh, Captain Matt video fest <laughs> of everything that I could get my hands on with brochures from manufacturers, knowing where the high tier, mid tier, and low tier was. And I knew right out of the shoot, I was looking for mid tier. I was looking for a good manufacturer. The three that were in my brain were Barletta, Harris, and uh, Bennington. Yep. The dealer that I first went to was Bennington dealer. They were closed. Couldn't really see their product. Uh, the second day, um, I went to a Harris Barletta dealer. I knew they had a Harris 230 in there. Um, and I went and looked at that boat. I had all four grandkids, my daughter, my wife, they're an hour away from me. Um, it's called the sports shop in Roxborough, North Carolina. Okay. And, um, their parking lot was completely empty and they had a picture in the hallway as you go to the bathroom of how that place was filled with boats and they'd sold everything they had. Yeah. Well, sitting in there was a, was a pontoon Barletta, was a, uh, Grand Mariner, Harris, 25 foot. Uh, I think it had a 300 on it. And a Solstice 230-200 um, Tritune, which is what I ended up buying. Okay. And here's the deal. Because I had binge-watched all your stuff, I knew exactly that I was worried about layout. I needed a, more than 150 horsepower on a Tritune. A 200-plus would have been good. So this had a 200-plus. Well, it was 200. It was a Mercury. Of course, those come with hairs because they're yep. runs with owned. Yep. Um, there's a – it's the Tritune. It had the um, – what they call the Performance 3 package – which that big driver for me was a 63-gallon fuel tank. Um, I'm thinking, that's awesome. My Ford F-150 has a 36-gallon fuel tank, so I'm big on big fuel tanks because I don't yep. want to be making trips all, you know, every other day to uh, to the gas station. Um, but it had the, you know, the lifting strakes. It had the full tri-tune all the way through to the back. Um, you know, it had all the whole stuff that I knew was the performance I needed because I knew for our family, cruising and water sports, uh, tubing, skiing, don't know if we'll do wakeboarding. I have joints that still need to stay together. Um, <laughs> so water skiing, we may end up doing that. But we're, yeah. we're doing tubing right now, and the kids just think it's out of this world. Uh, I bet the grandkids and, love it. I've got kids that age, and they're, that's one of their favorite things. Oh, yeah. And so um, anyway, I see this boat. It is not cheap. Um, they loaded it with $25,000 worth of options. Um, but they're, they were, in my mind, the right ones. Um, and so it was one of those things where you could say maybe it was an impulse buy. But it was – this is checking all the boxes that I knew, and the layout. My wife walks up there, and she goes, I like this layout. What's the layout she likes? Captain's chairs. Yep. Uh, Co-captain's chairs. The sales guy says, I cannot sell this Grand Mariner 25-foot over here because it doesn't have captain's chairs. Yep. Everybody wants captain's chairs. I guess the everybody is the wife wants the captain's chairs. <laughs> well, yeah, the, you can't have a conversation if you're sitting in the, in the back and the, the uh, captain's in the captain's chair. Having the, the two side by side makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So, I, you know, I look at her and I go, what do you think? And she goes, it's got this big lounge. So this is their, they call it SLDH, um, DLH, I think. And that's with the big lounger in the back that has the yep. three position. It flips forward and backwards so you can make the back of the lounger go in either direction. You can face to the stern. You can face to the bow. Hey, new boater, listen to that jargon. And I roll off. Yeah, you got it. Um, hey, you can roll up to the dock and you, other than backing it down, as long as you got that matter, they'll say you've been a long time pro. There you go. There you go. The only giveaway is my goofy hat. So <laughs> anyway, I um, so I, I asked my wife because obviously she needs to be on board here. And I said, what do you think about this? She said, I like this layout. I like this chair. She said, I really like it. And this was new for 2020. Just timing is everything. For the solstice, they completely redesigned it, and it has this huge swim deck on the back. So it's a 23-foot, what I would describe as the playpen area. So okay. that playpen from the bow to the stern, but it's 25 feet to the end of the deck at the stern, and then it's another two feet. So this rascal was 27 feet, uh, two feet for the engine. This rascal was 27 feet of boat from bow to prop, and it sits on a uh, trailer that from the trailer hitch at the ball – to the prop is 36 feet. So this is a lot of rascal here. And um, that swim platform is just huge in the back. You know, it feels like, uh, like I said, the measurement was like two plus. It feels like, you know, three plus feet or so. But when you stand on it, you know, it's, you know, it's very roomy back there. 
And that's where the kids love to come in and jump off, although it goes right through the front. You can flip that front door up. And, of course, my grandkids are using it as an aircraft carrier takeoff, <laughs> and they're running straight out of the front, jumping. And as they get bigger, they'll probably – my son-in-law backflips off the front of it. Oh, sure. And, and they're going straight off, you know, the front of the thing from front to back and um, hanging around in the back, you know, at the swim platform and uh, punching buttons because they found that they can control the stereo from the swim platform because it has those little control units that are at the lounger and then a lower unit at the swim platform. But anyway, we're looking at this thing in the shop and it's checking all the boxes. And at the end of the day, I knew I had the right boat for what we wanted to do. The only issue for me was what price could I bring this in on? So yep. I asked, I asked the really, the really dumb question, which I knew the answer to, I said, so for this price is the trader included? Of course it wasn't. <laughs> and, and, you know, so we start the, and so I look at my wife and I go, so what are you thinking? Would this work for us? She says, I really think it would. And of course I've got, my four grandkids with all their DNA all over every boat in that showroom. <laughs> I wish there were only about four. And, um, you know, they're checking it out and they're excited and everybody's excited and they had not, you know, had a boat experience, you know, before. Um, and so, like I said, one week before July 28th, which is when I picked the thing up, I binge watched your videos. And when I stepped into that place and looked at that boat, I could tell for what it was that fit what we wanted to do and felt totally confident about that being the right purchase. Um, well, just out now, of curiosity, give me three or four things that you pulled from the video that you – are the videos because I've got – I don't know how many are on that channel now, but a bunch, yep. um, the uh, Boat Buyer Secret Weapon channel. What are three or four things that were really key to you that you learned that you didn't know or that was maybe you had a misconception that was helpful for you? The tri-tune, you know, pontoon. So okay. I knew water sports was in play. I knew we were going to be at least seven and mostly nine. This has a capacity of 12. So I knew I needed my, – my number in my brain was 10-plus. Anything I could get for 10-plus people that was rated, that's the way I wanted to go. Okay. And I knew because water sports were in play, I needed a tri-tune for performance. And so it was tri-tune. It was engine size. I knew that I needed to be above 150. This was a 200 Merc. It's their four-stroke uh, V6. Yeah, did you watch um, the, the horsepower video that I did? I did, On absolutely. kind of what, what you can expect? Yep. Okay, I good. did on that. So I'm getting about – I do 40 miles an hour on that thing. Um, and so uh, back to what I was telling you about my son-in-law, the very first time we ever got on it, um, there was eight of us, so my son-in-law was able to join us. And I, I'm doing the break-in because I read all the stuff of what I needed to do. So I'm, I'm doing all the varying RPMs and so many minutes at wide open throttle and all that at yep. various times through the first two hours. For Mercury, it's a two-hour and then an eight-hour break-in. Um, with what they want you to do in terms of RPMs. But I go to a, not quite wide open, probably three quarters. And my son-in-law turned to my daughter and said, I've never seen a pontoon boat with a bow rise up out <laughs> of the water and take off like a regular, you know, V-hole boat. Oh yeah. Even quicker. And, oh yeah. So he was stunned and I'm hauling a major flag uh, in terms of uh, aerodynamic drag. I got the Bimini up. Yep. You know, it's a 10 foot Bimini. Yeah. There's so, miles, three miles an hour right there. Yeah. So, you know, we did 38 miles an hour that first time. And, um, you know, he was stunned. I was, I felt like, you know, I didn't have, I didn't know what the experience would be since then. I've looked at that particular video about where the, what kind of prop you need for what kind of power you need and all that okay. kind of stuff. This is rated at, um, supposed to be it's uh, max, uh, RPM is 5,800. And when I got eight people on there and a full tank of gas, so think about that 63 gallons, seven pounds per gallon, yep. 450 plus pounds of fuel. So uh, this guy is, uh, he's getting around 5,300 RPM. So I'm close mm -hmm. uh, with that particular, you know, prop size and pitch. 5,800 is the max. So yeah, about if, 500 RPM. You, yeah, with just you on the boat, though, you're probably getting real close to that 5,800. So Yeah, so we've never done it, just my wife and myself. We yep. always had seven people on that thing. Oh, yep. And so because the grandkids here, we're going, you know. We'll be <laughs> They're home. not missing out, huh? We'll be disowned if we yeah. ever find out we've gone. You know, we're going to have to sneak off somehow to go <laughs> by ourselves. No social media. Don't tell them anything. That's right. But back to your original question. So what were the things? So it was I knew I needed Tritune. I knew I needed more than 150. So 200, check that box. The layout needed to work. My wife checked that box. Did we feel, you know, we're going to have a minimum of seven, mostly going to be nine when I got the whole fam. Do we feel, you know, claustrophobic? Does it move right? They all felt good about that. Obviously, that particular line. Uh, and I know most of the manufacturers use the same interior guys, but that particular quality of um, trim that was on that particular boat felt good. You know, we didn't feel like that, um, you know, there was a, a high dollar price and a low dollar feel. Yep. Um, 
And so those kind of things, and you can only get that when you get on it, walk it, and touch it, you know, kind of thing. But at the end of the day, I mean, it is made out of, you know, vinyls, fiberglasses, and metals and stuff. So it's just, you know, the quality and the craftsmanship that, that you hope you would find where you're going to spend that kind of money. Um, and so those were kind of the, the, the really big things, the, you know, the performance piece, the layout piece, um, both with the holes uh, and the engine size. And then did it just have the kind of amenities? Did it have a lot of storage? This thing has got storage everywhere. I wouldn't, you know, is the sound system a super big important thing? I think it's nice. But when you get in at a certain trim level, a lot of the other stuff kind of comes along with the deal. You know what I mean? Yep, for and sure. And so there, there were a lot of other things that just amped up the, gee, this is a nice boat. Um, you know, I turned to my wife, what do you think? This is a nice boat. Turn to my daughter, what do you think? This is a nice boat. Um, so uh, those were kind of validations, you know, that I needed, that my family was good with. That's why I brought them with me. Um, does that necessarily, you know, of course, I'm asking them those questions while the sales guy's not there. But, <laughs> right. But to be fair, think about it. He sold everything he's ever had this year, the biggest year he's ever had. Yep. Whatever deal I could put together with him, if he didn't like it or wasn't making money or wasn't fair to him, and I've always said, I don't care if you're buying cars, cheap cars, expensive cars, boats or whatever. If they make the deal with you, they made money. You know, nobody's going to get somebody who's going to lose their shirt uh, on a deal in most cases. Right. And if you're buying in a situation where the seller's, you know, out of inventory, uh, to be honest, and I'm smart enough to know, I don't have a whole lot of negotiating leverage on the price. Yep. But here's what I wasn't going to do. I sure as heck wasn't going to pay sticker. And he sure right. didn't offer me sticker. And obviously, I'm looking at a $4,800 trailer, you know, on top of that. Um, and so I reviewed your trailer video, so I knew what I was looking for in that trailer. Check, checked all those boxes, made sure the weight of the, um, you know, this is a reputable dealer. They sell these things all day long. They know how to outfit them. Yep. Clearly, he's outfitting them for a customer that he knows he's in at a premium price point. He knows he's in the right ballpark for folks that want that price point. And he knows what kind of options to put on there and how to power it, you know, where they will be satisfied. Exactly. So dealing with the right kind of dealer, I think I kind of got that right out of the chute. So here's new buyer, boat buyer Rod, walking into his second place and never saw anything at the first place, looking at this particular boat, checking the boxes, wife, daughter, everybody, grandkids are all looking at it validating against the information that I got really from your videos. And I'm like, let's try to make a deal. Uh, so I made him an offer. He came back to me, not all the way. Um, but where I felt like it, it was good, we put the deal together. And the next week I picked the boat up and drove out of, uh, you know, that particular lot with the first time I've ever been towing 6,000 pounds and <laughs> 36 feet. Hook up and let's go. Yeah. But, so that's kind of, that's kind of what happened. Let, let me ask you, was there anything in the process that you didn't it sounds like you i mean you you have porsches you're into that it sounds like you probably have had some other toys um throughout your life is there anything in the boat buying process that caught you off guard that you were surprised to see that you we can let other listeners that are you know in your stage where you were three months ago four months ago um th so that they cannot be caught off guard or, or did you have a pretty good sense of everything that was going to happen well i would say that the, i'm going to answer your question and it was after the fact so okay. my answer during the process and to be fair, I would say I didn't get caught off guard because I had a bunch of knowledge of your videos. And I'm not just blowing smoke there. You were my source to um, to make sure. And I knew what I was doing. I've, I bought the first thing that I saw. And so I realized, geez, I could have made a mistake here. But the confirmations of what I needed. And then I had, you know, I signed the deal, but I didn't give him any money. Uh, we were basically, I gave him a credit card to hold the thing. I told him I needed three days to think about it. And then you know what I did? I went and called a whole bunch of marine places around and tried to get prices on similar Solstice 230s and made sure I wasn't buying, uh, you know, something for 40000 over that what it really needed to be. Right. Um, was I going to find the exact price? Did I get the best deal that's ever happened? Probably not. Did I get a reasonable deal? I think I did. And at the end of the day, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, I think um, I think that it's short-sighted sometimes to say I want to get the absolute rock-bottom deal um, because everybody, every situation is a little bit different, and sometimes you'll walk away from the perfect opportunity, the perfect pontoon, the perfect boat, um, and you'll miss it, or they do agree to it, but you got you got it so low that you don't get taken care of uh, over the long haul. You know, they're, I've seen it happen where it gets negotiated too low, and they begrudgingly give in because it's the you know whatever their reason is, but then the service after the fact can can suffer at times. Right. Um, so it, but back to your that, question, was there a caught off guard during the buy process? And the answer was no. And your information, I think, is a reason for that. Seriously, after the fact. Yeah. Um, 
the thing that stuns me, and I can't be the only person looking for this, is that I had priced at Lake Jordan enclosed garage space, uh, 12 feet by 40 feet. Um, I couldn't believe what they wanted for that, 385 <laughs> bucks. But guess what? You can't have it because there aren't any. Yep. And so I was like, where am I going to put this? And I knew I could find – you can always find outside storage anywhere. Uh, so I knew that – and I could park it on my driveway. It's not where I want to, but I don't have an HOA issue. But what what knowing that allowed me to figure out was for that kind of money, even if it was two or 300 a month, that is a real number um, every month, every year. It drove me to say, I'm going to build a boathouse. Um, you know, those metal buildings and yep. you can build those depending upon what you want between three and five grand and that'll pay for itself in a year and a half. Yeah. And, and so I cut out a place in my backyard that's in my woods. Um, and I actually have my little can am with a distributed weight hitch because the tongue weight on that rascal is 325 pounds <laughs> and the tongue weight on a can am can only hold 125 pounds. Yep. So I got a distributed weight hitch from Northern tool. And I hook it up to that uh, trailer and shove it out there with the Can-Am, and I can push that guy. I'm actually in the process of having that metal house built. Um, they actually built it next week. Um, but anyway, my point is I knew where I was going to store it. So here was the thing that caught me off guard. I'm going to store it at my place. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to tinker on the boat, and I don't want to go get in a car and go somewhere and mess with it. Mm -hmm. Now, I get it. If you live in an HOA and you can't get your boat near you, then that's your you know, your set of circumstances, and that's that's not great. But I knew if there was any way – I could have it at my house where it was with me when I wanted to mess with it, and I'm a tinkering guy, then that was what made sense for me. And then having priced enclosed storage, because if I was going to do it, heck, all the marinas were full. I didn't want somebody forklifting my boat around, even though they may have been careful. I just didn't want that dry storage kind of thing. So if I was going to do anything, I was going to back it in you know, to an enclosed building. But A, there weren't any. B, now where they be some next year, because I think to some degree there's going to be a lot of used boats on the market next year because a lot of first-time buyers did it for whatever reason that don't want to do it next year, and it may have been an impulse buy for them. That won't be the case for our family. But in any case, I knew from a price point of view, um, it made sense for me to have a metal building put together, store it there, and then here's the gotcha. I wanted a cover, not the mooring cover, which is awesome, by the way, but I wanted a cover that covered the bow to the prop. Yep. They don't make that. Somebody will custom make it for you, but what they make is something that – and I looked at you know, from West Marine to Overton, so you name it, and everybody I was talking to said, well, you're going to have to get somebody to custom make that. I wanted something that would just drape over you know, the boat because I'm going to be storing it under a metal building where the sides go down to about two feet from off the ground. It's somewhat open. There's a middle piece that goes across the back, and it's fully open in the front. Uh, and then obviously you know, uh, uh, a-frame roof on yeah. top of it. Uh, and then I got Crusher Run, you know, what they use for paving roads. That'll be my uh, thing that the trailer sits on. And I'll put two by, I mean, a four by eight sheets of plywood under there. I may jack that up sometime in the future. I don't know. But wheels, trailer wheels on plywood do fine with that sitting on gravel. Right. Um, so I think that is going to be fine for that. But what I wanted was a drape over cover that fit the boat. And you cannot find them. And the best that I've been able to find is a 20 by 40 foot canvas tarp that I could throw over everything. Okay. I'm, 30, I'm 36 feet from the prop to the um, front of the trailer at the hitch, but I'm 27, 28 feet from the bow of the boat to the prop. And so what, one thing you may want to think like about, that, and I thought that was, I thought that was weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's what you can do is talk to a custom canvas guy and ask him if they can put zippers on and then just get you the drape canvas and put some like beanbag weights on the outside of it, and then you can zipper that on. That that will reduce the cost a little bit. Where they're just sewing the zipper onto the to your cover somewhere that it makes sense. That might be a way to accomplish what you're looking to accomplish. Well, here's a question I would ask you. So okay. I'm in I'm in North Carolina, so winters are a little cold. Yep. But you know, they're not, I'm not living in Minnesota. Um, but I'm going to have the mooring cover on it, and then the building is, you know, somewhat enclosed. It's definitely enclosed on the sides. Okay. Um, I'll have the mooring cover on it, and I'm thinking I'll get – and motor covers, that's another aha. They seem to be a bunch of cheap stuff out there. It doesn't yeah. seem to be very nice at all for motor covers, and I've scoured all the different sources for that, and that's not a great thing either. I can't, I'm thinking I can't be the only guy who want a decent kind of cover you know, for you know, his engine because you could do the you know, bow to stern piece, and then you could just do the motor piece yep. um, you know, with covers. But in any case, my question to you is if I got a tarp – or a motor cover, and just a mooring cover, and I'm under my metal building, 
Am I fairly good to go there? Yeah, and you're worry keep, about a canvas. Keep the farm? poles in. Keep the poles in to keep the water from pooling. Um, keep those nice and tight. Well, remember, um, there wouldn't be any water pooling because I'm under. Well, a you're under. Really. Yeah, you're under the cover as long as it's not blowing in. The one thing I would I would say is is be cautious of is critters. If yep, you're, you know, you're that's funny. The, I okay. just looked at. You got that and, I'm not mind, blowing just, smoke at you, but I just watched your winterizing outboard motor video. This oh, morning. good, good. And the thing that you told me about, everything else I had covered and knew, and not because I have a great knowledge. I just researched it. And the thing that I didn't think about was critters. Yeah. And so if it's mothballs or something like that that I need to be on the lookout for. But remember, I told you I'm a tinkerer. Yep. So I think I'm going to be in and out of that thing a fair amount, but you don't know. And the longer that it sits by itself, the more vulnerable it is to things happening and you not know about it. Yeah, exactly. And I'll tell you, in the Carolinas, like you said, I'm I'm just uh, three hours from here or so. We've done the Christmas light parade. I don't know if on any of the lakes up there they do it, um, but uh, down here on, on several of the lakes, they do a Christmas light parade. And in December, we've been out on the water all bundled up with some hot chocolate, and it is a blast. Uh, well, it is a lot like of something that needs to be lot, done. Yeah, yeah, a lot of fun. So um, I'm sure somewhere up there they do it, but but uh, Lake Norman's not that far away from you that uh, if you're looking for a fun outing, it's um, it's pretty cool. So what is the right thing to get rid of critters? Um, well, that, I'm, I, mothballs is the one that I hear the most. Um, I'm hoping that on that video I get comments from other people on, on what their go-to is. Um, but other people have said something that's going to make some sounds, like some kind of chimey type things uh, right. in there that's going to just keep the sound away. And then um, I've heard of several others, but you just don't know if they're going to work. So I, I want to hear from other people what, what works. Well, and it I sounds to me like the, the big thing on. is to check, keep checking the thing. Yeah, I know yeah. I put it out sort of, quote, in the woods, unquote. Um, so if I'm doing that, then I need to be checking on that thing. Yep. And that's yep. probably the one of the best things I could do. Hey, quick question. Um, sure. As a Porsche guy, typically a lot of people, I wasn't one of them, but a lot of people grab their car, and it's a weekend warrior. And so they've got some other daily driver, and they keep their car in a garage. And sure enough, they may not get to it, and batteries die. So that's a common yep. thing with Porsche owners. So there's a huge market for trickle chargers. And SeaTech makes a trickle charger that has a connection that is a cigarette lighter adapter. So think of a trickle charger that typically you had the two clamps, and they clamp onto a battery yep. or rings that you actually screw it into battery terminals. Well, think of disconnecting that and having a normal bullet nose um, cigarette lighter charger adapter. Well, you okay. plug that into the cigarette lighter, and you are actually trickle charging the battery. You're back feeding it. Back charging. Okay. Lighter. Yep. So I actually plugged one of those up, and you know, uh, by the swim platform, there's some USB ports, and there's a cigarette lighter adapter. So okay. it's easy to get to without climbing onto the boat. Um, I can get to it from the side, and I plugged in my trickle charger, and then cranked up the accessory on the key, and on my dash, one of the uh, LCD displays that I have tells me the battery voltage. And so um, I could see that that battery voltage was increasing. So now my battery system, I have two. I have battery one and battery two. I guess they do that because if you lose one, you can go to the second, or if or you can go to both of them at the same time and have yep. enough charge. So I've actually got two batteries, and that's the first anything I've ever had with two batteries on it. So um, I assume that they are in some kind of um, circuit where if I'm if I plug that battery charger into the cigarette lighter adapter and backfeed. I guess I'm charging, trickle charging both of those batteries. Do you think that's a that's a long term good play? I, I don't know anything about that charger as long as it has an automatic shutoff. Uh, it does. It gets to the right level. Okay. Um, and then, what kind of battery switch, if any, do you have for your batteries? Do you have a one, two, and both, or do you just have an on off? No, it's a. So at twelve o'clock it's off. At nine o'clock it's battery one. Okay. At three o'clock it is battery two, and at six o'clock it is battery one and two. Okay, so what when you put it on, um, if it's on one and two, it's going to charge both. I would imagine, and if it's oh, you know, I didn't think about it's that. On you, need one, to, you need to crank that switch to one and two. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise you're because you're back charging, uh, yep. you're not getting to the other battery if you're just on one or the other, or if it's off. Right. Um, yeah, this is these chargers, like I said, are made for Porsches, and I you actually did use mine, um, even though it was my daily driver. There were some times when I go on vacation, or whatever, and I put it on there, and so these take care of Porsche batteries all the time and those are not cheap there's nothing on a Porsche that's cheap yeah so, I would imagine. so those battery chargers they do they're smart chargers they that's why they trickle they'll yep. do a fast charge and then they'll trickle and they'll go to nothing depending upon what the battery needs okay Perfect. and I was just thinking I could do the same thing now I could pull them out but I was thinking you know because your winterizing thing was talking about pulling them out and as long as I'm dry in there I was thinking and kept them charged yeah I was that's, thinking that's maybe I would key. leave them in there and keep checking on them and just make sure that I'm 
not having any other kind of problems. And what I really need to do is I need to make a, uh, for the upper Midwest and um, where it's freezing, and then for us in the South, because it's slightly different. If you're putting it away for six months, pull it, put it in, you know, block it up and, and put it in the garage or in the basement somewhere. Uh, but here in the South, it's, we don't have that extreme and you're probably going to run it. And if you have a trickle charger, you're, you're addressing that issue anyway. Um, right. But uh, it's when you, when you just let it sit, attached or hooked up um, for three or six months is when you're going to, you're going to kill your battery and, and reduce the life of it. So yeah, I think right. you're, you're totally fine. Um, and you know, it's not unthinkable that October, November, you're going to be out on the boat once or twice. Um, That's the plan. Yeah. I told, so, uh, you know, it was so funny. Uh, we were just out last week and, you know, it's just unusual until you do it. You don't know, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And it's 63 degrees in the air and it's 81 degrees in the lake. <laughs> and yep. so the kids were like, you know, it's hard to go anywhere when nobody wants to get out of the water. <laughs> so, yep. so they were like, we're staying in the water. And um, that was just an unusual thing. And I'm thinking there's there's only a very small window that you're going to have that situation where the air, you know, is much cooler than the water. Yep. But um, I was telling them, you know, we are going to be doing some stuff where we're not getting in the water. We're going to be running around. Um, and for them, that's probably going to be, you know, thinking about fishing. And I'm just, um, and I kayak. I have a, a tandem kayak with them. And okay. I take them out one at a time. And I got to tell you, a tandem ki kayak with a six-year-old and a fishing rod in front of you, you know, that keeps you very, very aware of you know, what's imagine, going on yeah. around you. And I'm thinking <laughs> I outfit four of them with fishing poles, even on a 23-foot pontoon boat. There's going to be a lot of action. Yes. Um, and and not, not much of it's going to be pulling fish in. <laughs> but um, I'm thinking fishing and um, cruising would be our winter you know, oh, for sure. Southern winter opportunity. Yeah, yeah, e exactly. Well, let me let me ask you another question. We're gonna we're gonna take a step forward. So you've owned the boat since July, been mm -hmm. out several times with the family, the grandkids, the um, and your daughter and, and son-in-law. What are a couple of things that you discovered the first handful of times out that caught you off guard? That you realized, hey, maybe I need to practice this a little bit, or I need to get better at this skill uh, because I'm I'm brand new to this. Any, anything along those lines? I'm really looking for ideas for additional videos uh, well, and for other things that will be helpful. So I can, I'm like most people, I can be influenced um, by money. And so my insurance guy, uh, and I have my insurance on people taught me out of it with a certain provider. And I have a lot of things and I'm comfortable with them and I've had claims and I'm, I'm kind of, if you take care of my claims and you don't give me a hard time, I'm probably going to be very loyal to you. And I've done that. So when it came time for the boating insurance, I went to the same place. I didn't try to shop it. Um, I'm sure I could have got a better deal, but uh, life's more important to me than a few months, you know, a few bucks here or there. Right. I don't think that it would have been thousands of dollars a year and it wouldn't have changed my lifestyle. So in any case, I, um, he's talking to me and he goes, well, if you take the North Carolina boater education course, then I can save you $85 a year. Well, that course costs 35 bucks. So I, I'm, I'm thinking if I take it, I've paid for it in the first year. Plus, I'm sure there's probably something I need to know. And so there was a ton of great information. And so I passed the test and did that. It takes three hours. And it's so funny. It doesn't let you blip through it. If you, yep. if you fast forward, it doesn't do anything. It's going to stay on a page for whatever time they think is enough for people to get it, whether you already read it or understood it or not. You're just basically going to, you're going to spend your three hours no matter what. On <laughs> no taking that course. There are no shortcuts. Now, you may be wandering and doing something else in your time frame. But uh, it, they're not going to let you rub through that thing in 20 minutes. But in any case, it was super useful. And I'm sure different states have different things. So I, I would say take a boater education course because, like I said, and I know it's a, it's a worn out cliche, but it's absolutely true. You don't know what you don't know. And navigation stuff, what does that pylon mean? Well, that pylon means that if I go in between that pylon and the shore, I'm probably going to hit something. Yep. And so don't go to the right of that pylon. Well, which pylon is that? Well, there are different ones. And so you better know them. <laughs> And so my point is that there, there are even the pylons that they had in the education course, different lakes have different pylons. So what caught me off guard was the thing that I had studied for and looked for. I didn't exactly see that. However, I knew enough about the placement of pylons where I knew that one with the black stripes is the one that I don't need to go between that and the shoreline. Right. Now, the ones that mark where I was going to go had the green, you know, um, they had the green and the red, and you okay. go north and south. That's how yep. that course was taught, but they don't yep. have that on at least the lake I'm on. Yeah, those There's are pylons in the middle of the channel that have letters of the alphabet. Okay. And then they go to double letters and that kind of stuff. So that kind of – so navigate – my point would be knowing navigation stuff would be really important because you need to – I mean, 
you could be doing something innocently that's wrong, and there could have been an indicator there, pile on or otherwise, that would tell you not to do that yep. um, from a safety point of view. So those, I think, are you know important things. And even though you try, like I did, to be educated, depending it varies by bodies of water that you're in as to what your navigable signs are going to be so try to find out what your navigable information is for the particular body of water that you want it, i would have thought that would be standardized it's not so that's yeah. weird to me it, it is on any um, anything that leads to the ocean essentially um, anything that's a navigable waterway that's going to lead to the ocean it has the the cans and the nuns and the um, you know all those buoys that you're talking about um, but other other lakes um, not necessarily. Uh, they may use a different different system, especially inland lakes. Yeah, can you hear me okay? No, you, you started. You, you just disappeared for a little bit, but I got you back. Yeah, my AirPods died. I've been talking way too much, and you've been talking <laughs> not enough. I guess. Well, no, that's hey. Listen, I talked plenty in the videos, and this, I thought this would be an interesting uh, because you did watch so many videos, and you were you made a, a great decision, and you're super happy with your decision. I just wanted to share with the listeners the the thought process and how you went through it. Um, any any advice that you would have for people that you know were in in your shoes before you made the decision to buy the boat? Um, anything else that you would add to say, hey, this is really going to help you so that you are happy and you're, you know, you're not somebody that bought a boat and then next year say, ah, this isn't for me. Either, um, you know, you're going to say, man, this is awesome. We made a great decision. We love it. Yeah, you know, I, I think your factors, I think, are, are really, really important. You know, what do you want to do with it is going to tell you what, I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to decide is the whole boat thing. And if there's a feeling that you're, you know, uh, over the fence of yes or no, that you, yeah, I think I could do the boat thing. Um, then once you're past that, then I think you've got the, the two or three things that I think help your decision. And it's just about what are your options and how much do you want to spend? Yeah. At the end yeah. Of the day. Fit, fit your so budget those, those into are there layout. as well. Those are layout. Those are uh, what kind of haul situation if you're doing pontoons. I mean, for me, it was pontoon. So it was a pontoon tri tune question. And with what I want to do, I do I need to try to. And then there's the power of your engine. And I'd say for a pontoon boat, buy the biggest that you can afford. But that doesn't mean you have to go 400 horsepower. It doesn't. Um, yeah, I think your number is right. Try two, 150 plus if you want to do water sports. If you're 200, you're great. You're going to love the 225 better. Uh, I'm sure you are. Do you want to pay another five, ten grand for that? Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't exactly. know. Do you need to? Do you need yep. to? No. But then, you know, there are people that nobody needs a Porsche and nobody needs a bunch of other kinds of stuff, but people want them. But even in those high end pricings, um, there are different models. And so not every Porsche owner has a Turbo S. That's the top of the line. You don't have to do that. You can go down the line and still have a great time. And I think that's the same principle, you know, with boating. And and it's like any other thing. You can spend as much money as you want. You just don't have to. So the performance, the motor, and the layout. And and I almost think the motor and the layout are the biggies because that's what you're going to be living with. The layout. Every time you get on that thing and whatever it is you do, if that layout doesn't work for you, you're going to be banging into things, not liking it, not liking to sit. You, you better have a good feel for that. Um, and so I think that's a huge one. And then yeah. power. I mean, when you've got a wide open throttle and whether you're pulling a tube or pulling somebody else and you don't get them up because you can't go fast enough or the thing won't get out of its own way, um, then you're going to hate it. And so you better be able to have enough power. The other thing that sent me toward Harris um, from your uh, videos was that other than Marletta, you had said it was one of the most stable boats. Uh, underway, you know, that yep. there is because of its construction. And I am plowing through, you know, waves and stuff. And it's like, man, this thing is just like a tank, but it doesn't, it doesn't move like a tank. It moves like a cat. Yeah. Um, it's a crazy one. I'm tubing with the kids. I mean, I'm turning that thing and we are ripping figure eights. And I never, I don't, I don't have any context. I've been in a boat where somebody's driven it, but I haven't driven it myself. But to me, it feels pretty responsive. I know what a Porsche feels like on a racetrack because I did that for nine years. And this, and I'm not saying this is a racing boat or any of that kind of stuff. I'm just saying I was impressed with what a three, almost 4,000 pound boat with nine people on it and a 63 gallon tank and a 200 horsepower motor hauling three kids in a sit down sofa style tube, what that rascal could do. Yep. Yeah, that's um, it's it's amazing when you when you make all the right choices, the you know everything comes together. And um, the the tri tunes, like you said about your son-in-law, it's not like they used to be. They there's a reason why pontoons and tri tunes are the the most popular growth segment right now outside of wake boats is because they just do it all extremely well. Um, so, well, hey, Rod, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you sharing your story and your your insights. I'm I'm glad that. Uh, 
I'm glad that you got a lot of value out of the videos. That's exactly why I created them is I, I want people to, to end up when they buy the boat to be exactly the situation that you're in where you say, damn, that was great. I'm yeah. so glad I've got this boat because now your kids, your grandkids are going to have the memory of being boaters and um, it, it's going to have the same impact like it did on me. I love the stuff that you said in one of your videos about making a legacy, and that's absolutely what, what I think we'll be doing with this. And and the information that you provide, I think, is invaluable. And I wanted to throw one more nugget for folks. Yeah, and at sure. the end of the day, some people can do this and some can't. I get it. But if there's any way that if it's a you and spouse situation and you can have the spouse be on the boat and you be in the truck or vehicle and drop them and they be the one to bring the boat on the trailer – you would not believe the teamwork of how that makes the world go a lot better. I don't care what else happens in the day, but if you can not just be the one who's doing it all and kind of spread that, especially to the spouse, I think it's huge. And we're not great right now. We're better than the first time we got. <laughs> um, and, and I'd say letting the boat go so the cast off is, I think, a lot easier than the retrieval. Um, but it's like any other skill. And I knew that the perfect thing for us to separate the problem was for me to do the vehicle stuff and my wife to do boat stuff. And she was kind of up for it. I think she was a little hesitant. Um, second time out, I was surprised. I went to go get the truck, um, and here she comes. I'm coming. I'm thinking i got to run down to the dock to cast her off. Here she comes, float the thing right onto the trailer. Yep. Um, now, she was – I think she was like, whoa, that was something. The next time we caught a little wind, it was a little harder. You know the next time, but we are getting to that. But guess what? She's uh, she's on the boat to retrieve it every time, and she's going to get better and better at it. And I'm in the truck, you know, pulling it out, and she's on the boat uh, to release it. And that works for us. And if there's any way you can make that happen, rather than you're in the truck, jump out, throw the thing, you know, you're going to be on a boat ramp forever. But I will tell you this: if you can go on weekdays, nobody's there, and so you can practice and do all the stuff that you want to do. But if you can split that between you and your spouse. Man, that just makes the whole day a ton better. My mom yeah. told me the closest they ever got to a divorce was at the dock. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah, I really, I really like that advice, Rob, because it is – sometimes you think, oh, well, you know, I've got to do it all. But the reality is it's, it's easier to do it together, um, and it makes everybody feel like they're involved, and, um, and it saves a lot of time. Um, I, I think that's great. It, they, um, when, you, when you team up on that, uh, just there, there's a connection. Like you just get each other, and yep. uh, I, I like that a lot. Well, anyway, that's my part of the uh, <laughs> Oh, there you go. Thanks, thanks for the input. Um, we had the idea, but we didn't know where to go, and you got us to the right port. So thank you, brother. Oh, you are you are very welcome. Enjoy that boat with the uh, kids and grandkids. Take care now. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Let's pull up the anchor and run this podcast back to the dock. We'll be back again with another helpful and fun episode next time. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, visit Boat Buyers secretweapon.com slash guest and I'll help offer insights into your boat research and shopping experience. Also, we'd appreciate it if you took just two minutes to rate and review this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. It helps others find us so we can help more boaters. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it in your boating groups on social media. They will certainly thank you. And by the way, if you haven't already, grab your free Boat Buyers Secret Weapon Toolkit at BoatBuyersSecretWeapon.com slash toolkit. And so you don't pay too much for your next boat, visit BoatBuyersSecretWeapon.com slash save for a short video. Now, before we go, I want to leave you with a few first-time boating tips for when you own your new boat. Number one, know your local boating laws, basic navigation rules, and how to operate your boat safely. It'll make boating even more fun for everyone. Two, be aware of your wake at all times and pay attention to no wake zones because you are responsible for your wake. When maneuvering at slow speeds, you can put out an enormous wake. If going slow, be courteous, save some fuel, and drop down to idle speed, just in forward gear to ensure there is no wake. This could save you an expensive ticket and will keep you from being that guy on your waterway. Number three, boats do not have headlights. They have docking lights, specifically made for seeing in tight quarters and docking. Do not turn your docking lights on while cruising down the water. It can blind other boaters and is very dangerous and, again, could save you an expensive ticket. Number four, follow the maintenance schedule for your boat. Change the oil, impeller, gear lube 
winterize if you need to winterize in your area. Inspect your trailer tires, bearings, and grease the hubs if you're a trailer boater to ensure you don't experience expensive and unnecessary repairs that will impact your boating time. Number five, always double check your plug is in, your battery is charged, and the fuel is full before heading out for a day on the water. It could just save your boating day. And if you're a trailer boater, I've got a few extra tips. Number one, at the boat ramp, prepare your boat your gear, and your guests in the staging area. Then when you're ready, back down the ramp, unload the boat, head to the parking lot, and right back down to your boat to be fast and courteous to your fellow boaters and don't tie up that ramp unnecessarily. Next, use transom tie-down straps when trailing your boat. Very bad things can happen if you don't, and they do happen. Three, Check everything in the boat is secure before heading down the road. Seat cushions, gear, keys, towels, even tubes and lily pads can get blown out when pulling your boat down the highway or interstate. And most important, have fun. Enjoy your boat and get on the water as much as possible because life truly is better on a boat. Until next time, this is your friend in boating, Captain Matt.